Stephen Cox YouTube channel sponsored by VMAC Air Compressor. Air when you need it. So today's project, I'm going to talk to you about a back on this project, a 2001 Ford F-350 7.3 liter power stroke with 400,000 miles on the clock. I bought this truck about a year ago and a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. I don't remember. Yeah, timeline suck, but I have been slowly piecing this uh, truck back together, replacing parts and components and doing some things that I find along the way that aren't done very well or weren't done right. And it gives me an opportunity to show you guys something on the Power Stroke 7.3s. One of the absolute most overlooked, undervalued uh, problems with these trucks that most of the time never gets fixed. In my opinion, every truck with 100,000 miles on the clock, probably sooner than that. If I was drive, daily driving a Ford 7.3 about every 30 to 40,000 miles, I would actually take these out and clean them. What it is, there's a component inside the fuel tank. They call it a strainer. It acts like a fuel filter, but it gets clogged up with algae and a bunch of crap, and it can cause a lot of drivability issues. So when you're going down the road, and let's say you're pulling a load, you're going 60, 70 miles an hour, the turbo's whistling, you hear that whine, it's in the background and your truck's loaded it's trying to get all the fuel it possibly can at that point and the strainer is in the tank if they're clogged your pump your electric fuel pump on the frame rail of this truck is trying to suck fuel through the fuel strainer or through those strainers and it can cavitate and cause all kinds of commotion some guys remove these strainers leave them out some guys clean them some guys do a whole bunch of modifications i'm not going to worry about any of those i'm just showing you right now how to drop the tank check those strainers and clean them as a preventive maintenance for your guys truck so i'm gonna go ahead and lift it up and we're gonna start moving the fuel tank so i got the truck up on the lift and we're gonna be working on a fuel tank now on these fords and every single ford truck the fuel tanks are on the rear of the truck driver's side right here um some trucks have the skip plate, some guys, that I, I don't know what it is. How many Ford trucks I've come across that are missing this skid plate for whatever reason? Guys, don't remove this skid plate. Your tank is plastic. It's a very strong tank, but it still needs a little help and support. We need to take these screw clamps loose. This is your um, fuel fill. This is your like vent for the fuel tank. When you're filling up fuel, you have a uh, way for the fumes to escape. Spray these down with some kind of penetrating fluid. I like this knocker loose stuff. Everything we're going to take loose on this truck, we're going to go ahead and spray down first. If you spray down these clamps, you can actually reuse these clamps just fine. The problem with these is you start taking them off, there's a bunch of dirt and grit inside that little hose clamp, and the more grit in there, the more friction it'll actually break your clamp. Straight millimeter. And I always try to take those off far enough to where you can just slip them out of the way like that. Now I'm gonna go ahead and spray this area down too with Dr. Loose. And you can use a screwdriver. I have to use these little hook tools. And just pull it loose. All right, now we got left is skip plate, which is, looks like some 12 millimeter bolts. It's like day day in a <clears throat> next Friday, man. Yeah, they tend. Now guys, when you get to this point, be careful. I have this up on a lift. If you take off the other two bolts back here, the skid plate's just gonna fall. Now the skid plate is not very heavy, but you don't want it to unexpectedly fall on you. All right, now we should be able to drop the skid plate. And like I said, guys, you really don't need a transmission jack to do this. Uh, you do need to do it, either drain all your fuel out of the tank so the tank is light, or just do it when you're on about a quarter tank of fuel. And uh, as you can see, the skid plate's not very heavy, but it is kind of bulky. You want some badass montage music for it? I could drop some sick beats. <laughs> Copyright free, baby. Let's run it. Original score. Okay, so I'm gonna lower the tank down just a little bit. There's some stuff on top of the tank that I still need to disconnect. There's an electrical connector for the sending unit and there's two fuel lines. So lower it down a little bit and then attack the lines on top. All right, so up here, we need to spray these two fuel connections with some uh, penetrant. And then this electrical connector that you can't really see out of frames up here. Now, if you're really careful with these, you're fine. Um, if you manhandle them, you'll snap them and you'll be replacing the fuel lines. There's one down.
And two down. All right, now we're ready to drop the tank. So when you get to this point, I see most guys screw up. Do you see all the crap and dirt around the top of this tank? If you try to remove this ring and deal with this fuel pump or fuel pump module or whatever the hell is in the tank, all this junk is gonna go inside the tank, whether I don't care how careful you think you are. So before you do that, we're gonna clean up the top. Take these little blue caps from this Caterpillar kit. We're gonna close our lines just to make sure that we don't get anything in there. Take your air nozzle. I'm out of air pressure, so I'm gonna go start my air compressor real quick. So now that we have all of our um, right air pressure, now make sure you spend some time and actually clean around the area. Try to get it as clean as possible before you take it loose. There you go. Um, they make a special tool to go on here. I've never bought it. I've always used a whatever screwdriver I decided to use as a pry bar. Hit it on the side like that, take you a dead blow. Once you get to that spot, again, we're gonna press down on this module to kind of keep it sealed and try to blow all that loose dirt away. Now, we can take this lock ring off. We'll take this module out. Be very careful when you pull this out because there is a sending unit rod with a float on it, just like that. Now, this is the actual unit that we're trying to get to. Something else about these, you see this fuel pump pickup? Do you see how um, flexible that is? This is just about ready to crack around this whole section right here and just break off. This happens all the freaking time. This one's just barely about to crack. In my opinion, what caused this was the removing the, you know, the sulfur from fuel and going to like an ultra low sulfur uh, content, it really jacked up plastics and fuel lines and everything. Um, something else, uh, I'm glad that we took this apart. You can tell there's all these chunks of plastic from something where somebody has been in here before that looks like pieces of an old pickup tube um, that got sucked in here. So somebody's been in here and replaced this before, and when they did, uh, they didn't bother to clean the tank out. And those screens that are in here look very, very healthy, what I just saw. So, so the only component that we're worried about right now is actually inside this unit here. I'm going to go ahead and take off this strainer clean it out, um, try to put it together. Probably gonna go ahead and buy another strainer. This one's, just, that flexibility right there really concerns me. It shouldn't be moving all that much. Okay, so it is out. Now I can actually look at the back end of this and see if it's actually cracked. It actually looks like a pretty good unit. There's some trash and stuff in it, but it looks like it's an updated one. So that's what I'll do is I'll take this screen out and get all this, um, not exactly sure what this is. It's a piece of rubber or hard plastic out of something, maybe a tank fill or whatever goodness is in there. Worry about that later. Right now we need to worry about this little module here. Do not pry this thing as hard as you can. Just gently work it out and you won't break it. So guys, this just took me about 10 minutes of jacking with it. If you get in a rush and start he man in this and prying it out, you're gonna break the plastic. Some guys delete these. If you're gonna delete it, fantastic. I'm not gonna delete this one. I'm just gonna clean these screens out. But you pop it up like that. You can see you have an O-ring there. We'll hang that out of the way. And then inside here, we have two of these little filters. Now the state of these filters tell me, tells me Someone has been in here and cleaned these at some point because every one of these I've ever pulled out of a truck with 120,000 miles on them, these are caked in black. So I'm gonna take some brake clean. I'm gonna clean these two out and I'm gonna clean the inside of that out. And then we're gonna look down the bottom of our tank and see if we have any algae in our tank. So to clean these out, um, 
The dirt gets lodged in the inside, so you need to shove air from the outside in. And uh, that's clean enough. It's just a little micro screen. Now some guys will just take these and throw them in the trash and put that assembly back together and call it good. Uh, I tend to agree with that stance. If it's my truck, I will delete this whole assembly and do a modification on it, but this isn't my going to be my truck. It's gonna be one of your guys' truck, whoever decides to buy this truck. Um, if you do wanna buy the truck and you want me to go through and do the harpoon mod and all that stuff in the tank, then uh, I can gladly do all that, but my, in my opinion, for this build, what I want right now is just to get the truck drivable, reliable, to the point where it's a good used truck. And if one of you guys wants something done, like some aftermarket injectors, turbo, transmission, lift kit, whatever the hell you want on it, you can write me and say, hey, I'd love to buy the truck and I'd like to have this work done on it. And uh, if that's you, then let me know and we can work something out. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna put all this stuff back together. Now I do need to blow out some of this in here because it's got a little bit of dirt and trash in there not much and then you put them in now when you put them in this little um grab handle whatever you want to call it, it actually goes down like that doesn't matter which way they go you grab this guy and when you slide it back together just put it there and push it down with both hands equally Okay, so we got that assembly back together. If you guys are curious what this is, this is your actual sending unit for your fuel gauge. So you have a, a variable resistor in here and the higher the float is, the more resistance you get, lower the float is, less resistance or whatever the flow is, I forget what it is. Works off resistance, I can't remember which way it goes, but uh, that's pretty much it. I'm gonna grab a paper towel, wipe off all my dirty handprints, and now I'm gonna look inside this fuel tank and see if I can look at the bottom and tell if there's any trash on the bottom of the tank. So we're just gonna uh, siphon out some fuel. I know what a lot of you are thinking, why don't you just turn the tank over and dump it out here? Well, the problem with that is both of these tubes actually have a tube that extends down into the fuel tank itself. Because it extends down into the fuel tank, have the tank here, extends down. If you flip the tank over, all of a sudden that pipe is sticking up and there's three or four inches of fuel in there. So if you want to get all of the fuel out of the tank, you have to siphon it out. Now I'm trying not to disturb the bottom down here because we have a lot of algae in the bottom of the tank. And I want to show you guys what that looks like, um, explain how I'm going to clean it out and then I'll put it back together. Um, but I'm kind of glad we take the tank out of it because every diesel has algae and water in the tank. What it happens, whenever you get diesel from a gas station or a fuel station, a lot of times there's water that's entrapped in the diesel fuel and it's a, uh, it causes a problem. So after it settles, water will settle to the bottom of diesel fuel because it's heavier, it's more dense than diesel fuel and it collects on the bottom of your fuel tank. Now modern fuel tanks do not have any drains on them at all and I'll explain why here in a minute, but since it doesn't have a drain, the bottom just keeps filling up full of water, it keeps filling up full of water, and wherever you have water in a warm, moist environment, you can have bacteria, and that's where that algae comes from. So the diesel fuel doesn't actually breed algae, it's the moisture in it, the bottom layer of the tank. So the reason you do not have drains on fuel tanks anymore is because if you notice the design of this fuel tank, you kind of see this parting line on the side right here. This isn't actually a parting line. What happens where this plug is, looks like a plug, this entire tank assembly comes in a, looks like a tube, just a big sheet of plastic. It's huge, it's very, very thick, very thick pla um, plastic tube. They come out, they seal one end down here with heat over here, they blow in air and it blows it out into a mold and they call it like a mold injection, blow mold injected. Um, when they're done, they take that plug out, they seal that plug, so it's all one solid piece. Every single connection you have in a fuel system is an area where hydrocarbons can actually permeate through the connection out into the atmosphere and e the EPA actually regulates how much of that you can have on a particular vehicle. That's why they don't have drains in them anymore. Manufacturers try to eliminate as many fuel connections as possible because every single fuel connection is that much more polluting according to the EPA or at least their standards. 
So something else about diesel fuel a lot of people don't understand or don't realize. Diesel is very hard to ignite. We can have an open flame right here. You actually have to heat diesel up to, I believe it's 170 degrees, 175 degrees before diesel will actually catch on fire. And even then it's a very slow flame. Like you can have a puddle of diesel on the ground, catch them on fire over here, and it'll just slowly build flames all the way to the other side. So as opposed to gasoline, now gasoline, you have a drop of gasoline anywhere and a little spark or a little flame anywhere on the outside of it, gasoline will actually combust immediately. So much so that it's pretty scary when it happens. Working with diesel, a lot safer. It's not really gonna catch on fire and blow up on you. Working with gasoline, if you're not careful, you can ignite yourself on fire and everything else in the area. And uh, if you're in an enclosed area, you could actually have an explosion, which is not very fun. So while this is draining, I'll tell you guys a story about a personal story of mine about a friend of mine getting caught on fire. Back in 2006, 2007, a buddy of mine owned his own automotive shop. And we had a friend of ours, had a few too many to drink one night and her driving around in her Scion TC, she ran it out of fuel. The guy that she was with found a fuel can in the back of somebody's truck, some random stranger's truck that had diesel in it and filled her gasoline car up full of diesel. And that was only two or three gallons or five gallons or whatever it was. So in her infinite wisdom, they decided, hey, let's go down to the store we'll just top it off with gasoline i'm sure it'll work on a, run on a 50 50 mix between diesel and gas uh my buddy gets the car he pulls the rear seat out of the car pulls the fuel tank or the fuel pump he's in the back was siphoning fuel out of the tank to get rid of the contaminated diesel gas mixture something happened with him in the car an explosion uh caught him on fire from his waist up and it really messed him up they amputated his finger they amputated the end of this finger had to sew this finger to this finger amputated the tip of this finger and the tip of his thumb. He had second, third, and I believe fourth degree burns on uh, most of his body. He was in the intensive care unit for about six weeks, all because of a gas explosion or gas fire. I went, I remember it was a horrible time for all of us that were involved, you know, and, and it, fortunately he recovered and he's one of the most successful people I know in life right now. I mean, just financially, life, everything, the guy's knocking it out of the park. Uh, so he did bounce back from it and I plan on having him on this channel eventually interview him and let you guys uh, hear that of the whole story. But when you're dealing with gas, you need to make sure that you're in a well-ventilated area and you have no ignition source because you have a zero margin for error. Gasoline explodes and ignites so fast that you have no inkling that it's even going to happen until you're already on fire. You're going to hear a noise. You're going to look down. You're going to realize your skin's on fire. Um, diesel's not quite that bad. So if you guys will come look in the bottom of this tank, so in the bottom of this tank, you can see there's kind of some weird looking stuff over here on the side that could be some dirt or algae or something, something in the bottom. Now, when I, I roll this tank over, I want you guys to see right there, there's floating pieces of plastic in the bottom of the tank. Uh, I don't know what that's from, but we're going to go ahead and clean all that crap out. So guys, that is pretty much it for those little strainers. Now, there's a couple of different ideas when it comes to this unit. I tend to think all the ideas are fine, whatever you wanna do. Some guys will take this unit apart, they'll put a little extension here, and then they'll have their uh, their foot or their fuel pickup, and then they'll move their return. They'll take a brass tube and go way out here because they're worried about cavitation and everything. Just take these strainers, take them out, completely leave them out of the system. I'm not gonna film putting all this stuff back together because you had the video how to take it apart. Just take the screens out, clean them, put them in. If you do need to test it. That's going to be in a different video. Eventually, I'll show you how to test for fuel inlet restriction, but not today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Remember guys, in March, coming up in a couple of months, I'm going to be in Las Vegas. Justin with the Good of the Land is going to be in Vegas at Con Expo, which is construction exposition uh, in Las Vegas. Only happens every three years. It's one of the largest in the world. There's going to be a ton of people there. I'm going to be there at the VMAC booth, booth, booth 501, I believe. I'll have some details in the future, so uh, stay tuned to the channel. You can meet me, shake my hand. Uh, the, I'll put the two days up somewhere. I think it's March 10th, March 12th, and the times will be on the board. You can walk over there, shake hands, get some pictures, and I'll show you some fantastic, exciting things that VMAX's coming out with. They have a three-cylinder diesel Caterpillar multi-process machine that does, it's got an air compressor, a welder, a generator, a uh, power takeoff, and a bunch of other cool stuff that's gonna be there, and I'd love to show you that machine. In the meantime, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Down in the description, there's a link to the Facebook page. Over on the Facebook page, you 
can actually leave your comments below. If you've ever modified one of these on your own, I wanna hear your stories about it. Or if you're familiar with this process, let me know what your thought process is as far as modifying the pickup to remove the screens, delete the screens, move the return farther over or anything like that. Hope you enjoy the video and get out and fix them.